All right. Um, and so thank you. This is our third session um, where we are going to be talking about um, scientific inf instrumentation. And just to quickly introduce um, our two folks who will be leading the call, uh, we have Luis Felipe Murillo, who is a assistant professor at the University of Notre Dame and has been doing a lot of work on organizing the Open Hardware Lit Review. And then we have um, our speaker who is joining us today is Jenny Malloy from the University of Cambridge. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Felipe and um, we can go ahead and get started. Right. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, welcome back. For those of you who have been following along, it's great to see you again. And for those of you who are new, new um, welcome. So I just have a few remarks before we get started, um, which is to invite all of you again, <laughs> for those of you who have been here all along, to join the lit review process. So I have prepared a document that I've been sharing um, uh, during our calls, which has the instructions of how to get involved. It's just a few very basic steps that explains how you can get started. The plan is for us, after we finish the public calls, the community calls, is for us to convene um, a meeting with everyone who um, uh, demonstrated interest in actually reviewing papers and drafting the review article with us. So um, as I mentioned before, um, this uh, review article has been in the works for, for quite some time. We couldn't finish it um, uh, one year and a half ago. It was me and Shannon, Julieta, uh, and Pietari um, from the GOSH community um, working on this. And because of several other responsibilities, we couldn't uh, continue on the work. So we decided at the GOSH um, gathering in Panama last year to um, open uh, the process of writing the literature review to everyone who's interested in joining us. And we organized the work in different components. So if you go to the link that I have in the chat, you will find find you will find uh, five uh, topics, which are the key uh, components of the review article. So we have scratch pads. There you're more than welcome to leave notes, your name, your contact, and also like if you have papers that you would like to bring to our attention, or if you want to go ahead and review an article. Uh, these are the scratch pads that we're going to use to then um, um, create a synthesis and bring to the main document. So if you follow the link, you will find these five topics, legal uh, scholarship, social and economic uh, and policy research papers, educational research, scientific instrumentation with Jenny today, and commercialization, management, and innovation. These are the five key topics that we found uh, in the literature, um, and we would like to concentrate on those to start drafting the review article. And if you continue to uh, scroll um, down, you will find the, the draft that we created. Um, and you will see that we advanced quite a bit, uh, but still there's substantial work to be done. We have been using uh, Wikidata and Scolia uh, for, 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 for to conduct the analysis. So we're going to have a dedicated session with Danielle Mitchin, who is in the call today, to discuss the use of Wikidata and Scolia to help us conduct um, the literature review. Okay, so you can follow um, this conversation in the GOSH forum. We're going to continue there to discuss the practical aspects of drafting the review article. But for now, without further ado, I would like to pass um, on to Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I will um, share my screen in a second, but um, I put together some slides, I think really to have a good discussion on this call about how we tackle the the science and standards section of the lit review. Um, so I'm planning to just introduce like very broad brush strokes, what the task at hand is in terms of how much, how many publications there are <laughs> already on open science instrumentation. And so I, cause I think um, we probably cannot, well, we clearly cannot describe them all in detail, but I think it would be helpful to like get some suggestions in this call on how we handle that in the literature in the lit review to what depth we go, how we kind of talk about that. So it's a little bit of a meta presentation. Some of the previous meetings have been a bit more kind of introductory. So I've kind of assumed that most of the people on this call have at least some um, from the previous talks, at least have kind of a grasp of what open hardware is and open science hardware. And we'll, we'll just dive straight into kind of what the lit review looks like, what the literature looks like right now. Um, I've gone pretty broad and I have not used an open tool because it was quicker and prettier to use. <laughs> 
continuous <laughs> web of science. So we're going to see some graphs. Uh, we don't need to use that tool for the actual lit review. I just thought it'd be helpful. And please excuse, I may have text wandering in it. Um, and then I just have summarized, uh, we talked about legal stuff before with Michael Weinberg, um, but I've just summarized where we're sort of the, the main standards um, publications in terms of open hardware, um, none of which are science specific, but I think there are also some links more particular to science publications as well. Um, so just to frame what I where I started with this, let me just open up the publication. Hopefully you can see this. Great. Um, okay, so um, we have a section in the lit review that's on open science instruments. Um, I think there's a kind of broader question perhaps as well as to what extent the review is open hardware versus open hardware for science as well and how to, what weight we give to those different sections but uh, I'm going to put that one aside for now. Um, so I mean I apologize for the very very faint bars on here I tried to make them darker but I think the, the message is basically that publications are increasing so I did a super broad web of science search um, which has definitely pulled in stuff that's not particularly relevant, but I did have a, a dig into some of the categories and I'd say it was, it's not done too badly in terms of um, getting stuff that's relevant. Um, so at the moment is it like 300 um, plus publications per year. And you can see kind of a pretty broad, broad increase really in the last, well, I guess since the Gathering for Open Science Hardware <laughs> started around 2015, 2016. So, so that's kind of a, a a trend which I think we all recognize, but um, might want to pull out um, in the lit review. Um, again, very light light bands, I don't know why. Anyway, the um, the highest number of publications that was were in the literature were, were from the US, China and Europe, which is not surprising because that kind of uh, channels other trends. And I'm not sure that we can pull that much out of it, but I think it's interesting to just think about um, who we have on the lit review um, authoring group. Um, for example, I um, I probably would not have put China as the second position just in terms of my knowledge of the literature of instrumentation that's been published. Um, so uh, I think it would be worthwhile talking to someone who has a bit more of a an interest in that space and may have been following um, more publications kind of regionally. Um, but that might be because when you pull out kind of because I did a super broad search, computer science and engineering comes out very high for open hardware which makes a lot of sense but it's also not my field so that may relate to why I was a little surprised in terms of um, how much was coming out of China that was kind of captured by this really broad term um, so that's not particularly surprising but if you take out engineering and computer science um, there's quite a lot of um, actually quite a match with what I would have said, which is quite, quite interesting to compare kind of what was coming out in this um, very broad search to my ideas about where the publications would be coming. So we're seeing a lot of kind of neuroscience, um, it's quite a bit of chemistry, quite a bit of biology, although it's spread across um, multiple areas, quite a bit of education and STEM education, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and remote sensing as well is represented. Um, I would say a trend is that the categorization is not um, very fine grained. Obviously this is just one literature search engine, but um, for example, multidisciplinary sciences is not very helpful. I also realized that um, instruments, instrumentation um, is the category that's been assigned to every single paper that was published in Hardware X. <laughs> so, the journal data is not particularly well categorized. And even when I went to kind of other searches um, and looked, because so we know HardwareX has, has hardware across quite a lot of scientific disciplines, um, but this is basically, it's very, very um, kind of very high level categorization. So I think that's something to discuss uh, if we wanted to get some more reliable data if we're not going to do a deep dive, but we want to present some level of kind of information on the extent to which open hardware and open science hardware is being published in different fields, um, I think we probably would need to find some better sites than I was able to or do some manual categorization. So just flagging that in terms of a kind of lit review process methodology and perhaps a technical question as well for um, the, the way that we use some of the tools uh, Louise Philippe mentioned. Um, so, so that's, I mean, that that's really all I 
<laughs> all I put together in terms of the science publication side of things that I was able to find. And I think the overarching question for us as a group is like, how do we want to deal with this in the lit review? Um, and what are the kind of useful points to pull out? Right now, the section on a science instrumentation pulls out sort of, um, I guess, uh, select some key papers that are illustrative of the fact that um, there have been publications in different fields. Um, but I, as you saw from the kind of increase in papers, there's many more available now than there were when the lit review draft was started. And so perhaps it's just a conversation about how we deal with that would be um, interesting. So I'll, those, that's my main question for the, for the kind of how we deal with the science instrumentation side. But the takeaway is effectively that there is quite a lot of science instrumentation being published um, across a number of fields, across a number of um, regions around the world, um, which is great to see, but there are some very clear kind of clusters of disciplines that have picked this up more than others. Um, and perhaps that's the kind of level at which we start describing it in the literature review. Uh, yeah, and then I was also tasked with talking a little bit about open hardware standards. So um, there are, I'd say sort of three, and then another set of principles that I'd highlight um, for this uh, section. So if anybody knows of extra ones that I've missed, then let me know. Um, but we effectively have the, the DIN spec 3105. I'll go through all of these in a second. Um, open know-how and open know-where. And then, which are um, by the Internet Production Alliance. I don't know if we have people on the call from the IOP. You can definitely dive in with more details on those. Um, and then finally, there's some efforts around the FAIR principles for open, for open hardware or FAIR principles for, for hardware in general. Um, which is being kind of led out of a research data alliance working group on hardware, but probably there are also people on this call that are members of that. There are people in the GOSH community that are members of that. Um, it's not, they're not really standards, but they are principles. And I think there's, there's some connection. Um, and also worth pointing out that kind of none of these standards are specific for science. Um, even though I was, I only mentioned that because I was tasked with kind of the open science instrumentation section, but the FAIR principles do have origins in kind of academic data sharing. So they have a, a sort of uh, an inclination towards thinking about hardware that's emerging from academia, as opposed to other sorts of hardware that might exist in open hardware that might exist in the world. Um, so just for those who uh, haven't come across these standards before, a very brief explanation um, the DIN spec 3105 is the first sort of um, the first standard that has been uh, affiliated with a kind of formal technical standard um, organization. So DIN spec is is um, a kind of a sim it's a European uh, standards body, um, which is a little I guess people may be more familiar with ISO, which is the International Standards Organization. Uh, these DIN specs are from another standards organization, um, but the, um, the DIN spec 3105 um, is, a, is a standard that's kind of, you know, not, it's not a regulatory standard, but it's a set of uh, standards for two things. There are two different DIN specs. One is um, documentation requirements. So we heard quite a bit from Michael about the sort of legal licensing side. And so the idea of these standards is that they go beyond the licensing, which is the legal openness of the object and designs, um, and try to create objective and um, unambiguous and enforceable criteria for the requirements for documentation for something to be considered open source hardware. So this is effectively above and beyond the legal openness of that. Um, but it's, it's tightly linked in a way to the open source hardware definition. Um, but it, it kind of makes things a little bit, a little bit, well, quite a bit more unambiguous. So the OSHWA definition of open hardware um, is still fairly broad, and this kind of tries to really break it down. Um, and then there's a second part to the standard, um, which is really like, how would you assess um, whether something meets the first specification um, and kind of lays out a procedure for, uh, by which open source hardware community members can effectively peer review um, hardware and decide if it meets the standard or not. So although the, again, this is not related specifically to science hardware, it is emulating the kind of peer review model that's used in scientific publishing. Um, and so I think this is clearly worth um, 
discussing in the lit review as a kind of uh, you know a key a key kind of building block in terms of having much more defined um, ideas or that of what open source hardware actually is and how we assess it. Um, and you can find out more. I just kind of I'll share these slides afterwards as well. And there's a link to an article by Jeremy von Vosson, who was on the Dinspec um, working group, and he explains a little bit more detail about what's going on. And of course, you can read the full specification online. Um, open know how and open know where are uh, standards that were created uh, by the well, what is now the Internet Production Alliance. Um, open know how is really um, a documentation standard, but it's more to do with metadata. So it doesn't necessarily detail what, how exactly you should document your hardware at a very technical level, but it talks about how you should document the metadata for that hardware such that it's discoverable on the internet. And so their initial um, initial round of open know-how standard production was around discoverability and having a, a manifest where you can fill in a digital file that can be harvested in a machine readable manner to kind of create repositories of um, open hardware designs um, that you can then port between different formats. They've, they've now moved on to think more about kind of um, data standards for documentation. Um, and there's there's more work on kind of how to um, circulate those documents elsewhere. I'm not, I haven't maintained a link with the working group. I was a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit involved at the very start. Um, so the interactive side, I'm not clear, it's in progress, but I don't know where they're at. So if anyone in the call is, familiar and working with the Internet Production Alliance, then please do dive in and give more detail <laughs> at the end of the presentation. Um, Open Nowhere is uh, much more about maker communities and mapping manufacturing facilities. So I guess there's kind of, it has a link to open hardware in the sense that open hardware is typically uh, thought about as a, as a manufacturable object, um, but it doesn't have kind of it's 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 I would say fairly independent of the open hardware piece, um, and it's really about kind of improving networking and um, discoverability and accessibility of those manufacturing initiatives. But I mention it because it's linked to open know how, um, and it's also underneath the uh, Internet Production Alliance group. Um, the Fair Principles is um, a more recent one. I just you can read the full um, working paper towards their principles for open hardware on archive and um, also Zenodo and other places. Um, I just kind of copied one of the tables from the from the journal uh, from the article just to give you a sense of what the group are trying to do here, which is basically um, there are these pre-existing fair principles for research data, mm -hmm. which have been around for quite some time and kind of form the bedrock of how people think about open data um, production and dissemination in, in quite a number of open science um, initiatives. I wouldn't say they're kind of universally accepted, but they've really kind of taken root um, quite strongly within the research data space. And so um, this is the uh, F or findable section. And so you can see that there are four points under data in terms of how to, to ensure that it's findable. Um, and they're fairly kind of uh, basic stuff, right? So they have a globally unique and persistent identifier. Um, they have rich metadata. There's more information further down on that. The metadata clearly and explicitly includes the identifier and that the metadata is registered um, or indexed in a researchable resource. So we're not talking kind of very in-depth technical advice here, but it's just to kind of really get the very base level of principles for how to make data findable on the internet. Um, and then you can see that there's that basically re a research software version was created that in the in the case of software, pretty much ported directly the same language and assigned it to software um, where it could be assigned directly. And uh, I think further down um, in the AI and R sections, <laughs> they do talk a little bit more about uh, slightly different um, requirements for software but findable is kind of uh, fairly applicable for anything. You can see, and so this is the proposed open hardware version of the um, FAIR principles, and you can see that they uh, had to make some additional changes there. Um, so for example, they've talked about using OSHPA or a trusted repository, um, and also the fact that 
there are multiple files involved that make up one piece of hardware. The same could also be true of data sets, but that there's kind of the hardware design and also potentially software that is associated with that hardware design. So they're trying to deal with some of those, um, some of those changes. Um, but as you can see, the rest of it pretty much maps on, at least for the findable section, um, to what we see for data. Um, so that I think is definitely worth covering in the lit review. Um, this was 2021 and um, there's a continued working group, um, but I couldn't find any further publications. If anyone has any, that would be great. Um, so I think it's it's worth mentioning because it embeds some of these ideas within a kind of a framework that's very familiar to academia already. Um, but I think it, it's sort of not clear to what extent this will be adopted more broadly and also feed into policy and how people are kind of designing future projects at the minute. So I don't think we can cover so much of that in the review other than to point to the fact that it exists. Um, and then there's also multiple papers suggesting kind of either categorization of open hardware or like how to, uh, what are the requirements for open hardware, how to identify factors that affect various aspects of open hardware. And so I've just kind of put a few here um, which are not really related to standards, I would say, but I wasn't sure what other section of the um, of the lit review sessions we we would cover this. Um, so just to say that there are there are these kind of categorizations and uh, scales of readiness, for example, is just one example of introducing readiness scales for effective reuse of open source hardware. And I think that they they kind of become um, they can become embedded as almost like description ways, standard ways of describing um, the, the hardware items themselves, um, but they're all pretty new, as you can tell, like 20, 2021, 2022. Um, so there's not, there's not a kind of a lot of um, building on top of this research yet, it's all quite recent. Um, and we should probably discuss where that fits nicely within the lit review as well. Um, and then, Another final point actually on standards is that there are some examples of open science hardware and probably open hardware as well um, interfacing with other technical standards. So I've just given one example here, which is a, a 3D printed multi-channel pipette that is um, compliant with an ISO standard for pipette accuracy. Um, I have seen other examples of science equipment where they've where the authors have basically compared um, their design to a sort of given ISO standard. Um, I think this is, at least in the science space, likely to be quite important for wider adoption. So I think mentioning in the lit review uh, to what extent people have been trying to do this would be potentially of interest. Um, it became a much uh, bigger deal in terms of open hardware for COVID, so kind of ventilators and other things that do have to adhere to very strict standards. The extent to which the open hardware designs did or did not adhere to those standards was a was a kind of key aspect of if they were able to move forward to regulation. Um, so obviously that's a quite specific section of open hardware, which is the medical technology side that has its own challenges. Um, but I think even in science, this idea of how open designs interface with broader technical standards would be um, perhaps worthy of a paragraph in the final review. Um, so I'll stop sharing now. That was it, my whistle stop tour of um, some of the broad spectrum of instrumentation that's already out there and some of the standards that we might want to mention in the, um, in the final review. Uh, and I think the questions I would leave you with are probably, I guess, two. So one is how we deal <laughs> with the many, 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 many instrumentation papers in terms of the lit review. Um, and then the second one is, I guess, uh, how we, what we want to include in a, in a section on standards um, and what kind of we feel is the most important stuff to cover. Are we going to try and cover all of it or not? Those are my two questions. Um, is that okay, Louise? Feet? I'm, I'm going to defer to you as like the, the of convener course. of the literature review to. No, no, of in. course. I think these are excellent questions to get us started. Um, um, I think we should open the floor for people to ask questions. I just want to make a, a historical remark, which um, in long, long time ago, you know, in a galaxy very, very, very far away, I came to talk to Javier Sehanu, who might be in the call. And um, it was a debate about whether or not to start a journal of open hardware. 
And he um, uh, called my attention to the fact that uh, it's really neat to have an open hardware journal, but um, most people working on scientific instrumentation, whether they're scientists or they're engineers working for research institutes, they already have venues where they submit publications, right? So what would be the goal of have a generalist venue? Um, and I think in retrospect, based on what you presented to us, I think Javier, and he just opened his, his camera, so I'm putting you on the stop of that, on, on the spot. Um, he, he was both right and wrong, which is a complicated thing to, to, to say, <laughs> but he was right in the sense that um, we see this effect of generality. Uh, we see that there's a dispersion of, of open hardware in different journals, and we're going to have to dig in different disciplines with the main knowledge to identify those. They might not be in the titles, you know, they might not be even in the abstracts. We might have to do some serious digging. So this is, I think, Javier was cautioning us a long time ago. And I think the point that I think he was wrong in a sense is that um, Obahadur X became this generalist venue, right? So we, you show that as to, uh, to us as well, Jenny, that um, there's a dispersion of publications there from several disciplines. It's even hard to tell which discipline it's coming from. Uh, so I, I will leave it uh, at that and, and just uh, um, invite you all to ask questions to Jenny. Um, if you have observations, questions, please, please feel free to just uh, raise your hand and jump in. Yeah, and also on the hard X point of view as well, there are, I, there are 385 publications in Hardware X, which at least is a data set that we know is definitely open in hardware. <laughs> so, so there's kind of just like, it's a quite a lot, I thought, quite a lot. So yeah, open to any thoughts people have in terms of how we tackle this, like many, many, many papers in terms of lit reviews and maybe people who've written lit reviews before have got tips and techniques that they've used to try and kind of give some, well, and also I guess what are the interesting kind of perspective, what are the points we can raise in a lit review that might give people something useful or interesting or insightful to take away? Um, yeah. Well, if there's silence, maybe I can chime in here. Daniel from the, uh, the Wikimedia community. Um, so we have been trying to um, map things, uh, like keep track of the literature in general, not just open hardware, but other topics as well. And uh, Scolia is one of the tools we use in this context. Uh, but we're building another one uh, that is uh, basically aimed at automating systematic reviews. Um, I'm pasting in the link here. The problem is the tool is uh, free beta, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it could actually be uh, useful in like in this context because like the open hardware community is all about like practical stuff and meddling with things. And uh, so I'm thinking about uh, giving this a try. Uh, but in order to do this, we would need at least a collection of PDFs, ideally, uh, let's say a collection of XML or whatever machine readable texts. And so the question is, do you have full text for at least a few hundred papers uh, so that uh, we could run the machines on this? Otherwise, uh, the automated approach doesn't really do much. If, if we have just a few dozen papers, uh, it's not good on this. I mean, we could do that. I guess the question is to what, yeah, um, if we're going down a systematic review route, presumably, so are you talking about having a corpus that we can check or like actually having the kind of systematic review corpus because we'd have to decide on our search terms and everything for that, which I don't think we've quite <laughs> figured out yet. Yeah, so um, the, the approach that we're working on is uh, aimed at making all of these steps automatic, but you can mm -hmm. automate them at uh, like to a different degree or you, you can play with the parameters. And uh, the main thing is to actually, uh, let's say, take away the responsibility for the researcher to um, choose which particular paper they include or, or not, because there is some subjectivity in, involved, but to come up with some uh, quantitative um, measures that allow you to play around with thresholds and then 
uh, you basically include or exclude every paper that is within or outside of the threshold. That's that's the the, the idea. And uh, so the the main creative activity that goes in there is then to consider the suitability of those thresholds. Um, and so it's a different process. But then once you have defined those thresholds, um, since they are computed based on the text of the papers and the papers shouldn't change anymore, they should be reproducible, which is a problem for all the standard systematic reviews. Even if you share the full uh, string of your queries and you run this now and uh, I run this tomorrow from another machine, I will get different results. Mm -hmm. And uh, let alone like a year down the line or something like this. And so the systematic reviews are very systematically not reproducible. Um, and uh, this can be addressed by uh, releasing some sort of a, a snapshot of the criteria uh, that were used to include or exclude things. And uh, those criteria, they might evolve uh, themselves, but still they're more easily applicable to future papers than the decision, oh yeah, this paper is in, this paper is out, right? That you made in the past. So that's just uh, a first comment that I wanted, that crossed my mind while we had the, the moment of silence here. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I think I think it'll be interesting to consider that. And then I, I guess the kind of follow on question is that once we have got that data and there's a kind of data, there's a data set that's included, what is the information, what is the useful kind of analysis to pull out for the literature review, review from that? Because I guess there's different schools of thought in terms of the value of bibliometric information in literature reviews and to what extent it's it's a useful thing for the community to have, because it will take some time to kind of dive into that um and to what you know you can you can do it like I did it at a very surface level in a very short space of time for this presentation but you can obviously go in and kind of do some more clustering and categorization that might give you some information you can do network analysis between like categories authors I mean I there's probably someone on the call with a much better grasp of sort of bibliometric research than I have um, but I guess the question is, you know, is that the type of literature review that we want to write that includes that type of work? Or are we more focused on a literature review that kind of tries to raise up the meta issues and the kind of bigger picture trends that are coming out of the literature? Um, and that, I guess, is a kind of a more fundamental question for the review and what people think would be useful. So um, but the, tool, the tool looks really interesting. I shall dive in and have a read through the link. Yeah, this, um, there was a conversation early on when we, um, right before we stopped working on the liter literature review, which was about the difficulty of taking a more traditional um, systematic review, um, as we see, let's say, in computer science or, you know, any discipline that is well established, has a repository with rich metadata. Uh, allows, like we know that the publications are indexed, so it allows for a systematic review. And early on in our case, we, we knew that important publications were not indexed. There was a lot of great literature and this was the topic of the conversation on uh, um, public policy, uh, social and economic research on free and open source hardware. Uh, new venues are also at the disadvantage like the Journal of Open Hardware uh, when it comes to indexing. So all of these challenges create um, a problem for us in taking a more traditional systematic review, but it doesn't mean that we cannot apply also um, a systematic review using Wikidata and, and Scolia, uh, which is something we did. We have a profile of open hardware, thanks to Daniel, who basically ingested the database we created for Zotero, a BB tech file, basically. And he and he has been working on this profile um, uh, of open hardware, which can be very useful for us. Uh, this is something I think might be a conversation uh, for us to have the, the, the whole group and and and, and um, come up with a definitive position on this because it's tricky. Um, yeah, and there's no point doing the work if we don't feel that it's a useful contribution to the community. So <laughs> it's kind of the not, I don't mean that the work that's already been done, I mean like the work that we could choose to do going forward in terms of, you know, we want, we could more, much more, um, do much more refined categorization and get a much sort of truer figure of how much. I, open hardware slash open science hardware has or how, how much open hardware has been published within particular disciplines that would be possible the question is if it's helpful or not um or if you know that's not something we need to tackle um 
does anyone have any other kind of strong feelings either way on if this type of uh, more quantitative approach is useful compared to more of a qualitative, you know, these, these fields are more represented than others. And um, these are some key publications that have kind of illustrate some broader points that we're trying to make. Maybe at some point we need to vote, <laughs> just decide one way or another. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Paul from Berlin. Uh, I, I am. Uh, I, I talk to to some people around me in the open hardware community about uh, the the systematic review, and they really had high hopes also for the community itself to see some some. Uh, uh, scopes of discussion to to get an overview uh, themselves uh, and by, by by doing so and uh, so I think it would be really useful to take the uh, qualitative approach but but uh, I think uh, we we maybe we we can nonetheless integrate uh, the the tool by Daniel proposed somewhat because I I, I it is really really much workload yeah and 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 if we could think also think about automating it partly in in future reviews maybe uh, it would be, be a huge step to to think about it uh, already when writing this one right yeah no for sure i think it would be really interesting to test it out I mean, for me, the main the main argument I could see in favor of, of having a more systematic approach and also ability to kind of integrate more quantitative data is that it's sometimes helpful for people who are doing more of the policy advocacy to be able to show particular funders and particular kind of, you know, um, policy people working in learned societies, et cetera, et cetera, that their particular discipline or area of focus has got a, a kind of present and growing representation within the open science hardware community on the other hand it can be negative if you're looking at like trying to convince a funder really like hey there's two publications in this space but we I mean I don't know <laughs> it can kind of go either way on that one um all right so I think we've got a kind of something to explore then with then Daniel in terms of how much uh, how much work it would be to scope out um, something that 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 pulls in publications through a, a more automated system and lends at least an element of systematic review, even if it's a slightly different methodology to kind of other colleagues who do clinical med systematic reviews would perhaps recognise. But that's that's it. We're experimenting, so that's good. Um, so move on to the second question, which was. So the other area that I, I was assigned was to talk a little bit about standards. I guess the first question I have is, did I miss any? Like, is there anyone here who knows of other standard standards that are either completed or in progress right now that we should be including in the lit review? I was missing uh, anything related to ethics. Um, of course, that's not necessarily specific to open hardware, but there are some ethical questions that are more or less specific to open hardware. And so I'm not aware of anyone working on this, but there are a number of standards around ethics kind of evolving, especially uh, like um, conversations with the community and uh, certain open hardware applications, they have a strong community component. And so we, we could maybe start from those angles, but uh, I, I'm not aware of anything that is specific to open hardware. Yeah, I think there are people on the call with kind of, links into more data ethics communities that might be using open hardware and I wonder if that's something we have already got in the review or would be raising. But it's a good point yeah we can add in the ethics side. Um, is anyone here from the Internet of Production Alliance or who's been heavily involved with the kind of open know-how open nowhere or the DIN spec standard? Okay, we're missing the standards people. All right, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. You'll have to deal with my uh, 
rather surface <laughs> review of what's happening. Um, I have a question, Jenny. Uh, what's the um, place of the open source hardware certification from Oshawa in, in this scheme of things? Because it, 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 the way I understand it, it tries to um, answer a similar question to the DIN standard. Is this proper open source hardware? And it is less formal. It is definitely not a standard, but, but it is kind of trying to achieve something very similar, right? Yeah, I think we should definitely reference it. The only reason I didn't reference it here was because my remit was standards, or at least things that are self-describing as standards. <laughs> so, um, but I think I think definitely it needs to be included. And and the um, the exponent, like the history of the DIN spec and kind of how the DIN spec describes itself, is is a continuation effectively of that kind of work. But to try and put, yeah, just some more an ambiguous definition that's more easily enforceable, um, we should we should clearly include it. I think. Um, does anyone else have other gaps that we they think we need to fill for the review or any any suggestions of points and uh, aspects we should include in the start in standards? I have another gap and that is uh, as someone who is uh, let's say not directly involved in open hardware um, uh, but an an observer and the thing that I'm often missing is uh, okay, I now have the design. And how do I actually make it? Like, where do I go? How do I find out? Like, for instance, to translate uh, the specs of uh, some hardware into, uh, let's say, the facilities of a fab lab I would need in order to build this. And that mm -hmm. translation happens in the heads of the people who are familiar with this stuff, but uh, there are a, a barrier to entry for people like me. Uh, that translation is hard work for me um like uh and uh that should be made simpler or if there are tools that uh, facilitate that they should be communicated they should be surfaced a bit better yes i think there are not specific tools so open the open nowhere should solve the once you know what tools you need where are the tools that's the piece that they're trying to solve um I feel like there may be something, it's been a while since I actually looked at the full manifest specification for open know-how. Um, does anyone know if there is a tools section on the manifests? As in this design requires these tools? I can't, I can't remember. I mean, if there were, it would make sense because it would link very nicely then to the open, <laughs> the open nowhere standard, but I just, it's been some time, but we should check that. Okay, well, what I'm hearing is that I didn't miss anything out particularly other than things where there are gaps in the sort of in the literature or in the kind of thinking of joining these things together. So that's that's good to know. Um, we've got, I think, 15 minutes remaining. Um, so I guess we could open the floor to kind of any question, any other questions people have about whatever we've been discussing for the last 45 minutes. Yeah, I have another one, and that is uh, close to like the manufacturers of scientific information, the classical ones. Um, I could imagine that some uh, take a very protective approach uh, of their own stuff and don't want any open hardware. I could imagine that's, uh, that others are more experimental. Uh, and I could imagine all sorts of, uh, let's say, intermediate approaches. And uh, I'd Right now, I just don't know much about it. So if that could be elucidated somehow, um, that would probably be also an interesting feature of this review. Uh, maybe it, it clusters also by field or by, uh, let's say, file type. It makes a, a big difference if, let's say, an open file format is already established in a field or uh, if it isn't, things like that. Yeah, I feel like that's a difficult, I, I'm, I, I will throw the question to everybody to have you seen any literature on that, because I feel like I haven't seen any literature that really dives into the perspectives of, of incumbent scientific instrument manufacturers with this, or even like, yeah, kind of tries to map out potentials in that space. The only thing that it brought to mind was there is some, there is some very early um, work in the open innovation community that talks a bit about 
scientific instrument users as innovators and the extent to which kind of designs that so that's more user innovation than open hardware but there is this sort of like sharing of of innovations around scientific instrumentation which has informed traditional instrument manufacturers to change their designs but that's like massively predating open hardware and probably not that relevant it just kind of sparked a thought i think there's an eric von hippel paper which is kind of looking at that um particularly for instrumentation um, but yeah anyone know of any literature that's exploring manufacturer perspectives or kind of disruptive potential for open hardware from a kind of commercial perspective we have a session on commercial stuff right so maybe that's the <laughs> that's the space to discuss this Mm. Well, no one's jumping in with any paper suggestions either here or in the chat, so I'm guessing it is a gap. So I, I know one somewhat related, not hardware, but um, biology. So I co-supervised a student who his PhD was basically on like the extent to which biotech companies are adopting what well, part of his PhD was on the extent to which biotech companies are adopting open source tools from synthetic biology, which as a discipline has a very kind of open ethos um, and produces a lot of you know, open source DNA components and various other bits and pieces. And um, he was trying to investigate the extent to which companies are worried or not worried about adopting and using those tools. But that was less about that was less about protection and more about would they take in an open source tool and use it in a commercial product? Um, would they be concerned about their inability to kind of integrate and protect that further downstream? Um, or would they embrace the fact that it's open and they don't have to license it? That was more the direction of that research. Um, and the sample size was incredibly small <laughs> because <laughs> it turns out that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of academic tools that have been produced um but the majority like finding the companies that are using them is quite hard <laughs> so yeah that's the only that's the only kind of other piece of research that comes to mind any other areas people would like to highlight in terms of the kind of piece of around scientific instrumentation or standards that you think we should consider or interesting papers that you think we should definitely read? Uh, I liked the differentiation you made between the standards for open hardware and uh, open hardware that uses standards. Uh, and the, the latter is also quite relevant in my opinion in the sense that it helps uh, interplay between different projects it motivates commercial actors to step in and take a role because uh, they, they can see that these are products that will be easier to sell so i, I like that and I, I think both of them are relevant uh, and and probably there is more activity on the on the latter one than on the former but yeah yeah, I think so. And I think so. I, I when I was looking for examples, I basically was just looking. I, I remembered some papers that I'd read, <laughs> which were very much in the biology space. But I think, I mean, it potentially would be interesting to understand more about how many papers explicitly reference the use of ISO standards, even if it's ISO standards for like connect, connections or ISO standards for kind of, I don't know, threads or kind of like mechanical or kind of electronic communication standards that could be quite interesting to understand if that's something that's uh, as I say the developers are actually considering embedding in their hardware or just not at all um, and I don't I haven't seen anything investigating that aspect so we probably couldn't cite a paper on it but um, you know if there's someone who's interested to kind of do a do a bit of a literature analysis on who who cites ISO standards in their open hardware paper that might be um, of interest. Okay, I have another one, and that is, uh, what's the interaction between um, open hardware and citizen science? In principle, there uh, there are lots of interactions already, um, but they again they they might depend on certain parameters that I'm just not aware of. Um, 
And uh, the question is whether that is something worth profiling in the context of this review. I am going to defer to Shannon. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think originally when we talked about this, there was actually going to be a, a separate section and Allison, um, who's on as well, might have some ideas. We're, we're currently working on a, a policy brief on um, open hardware tools for environmental monitoring. So it's a, it's a little bit broader than just for community science, but, um, but perhaps Allison, one of the derivatives from that might be building out a subsection or something that's specifically on on tools for community monitoring, which would also then I think bring in more of the the conservation tech uh, tools as well. I was personally surprised in my very surface level web of science search to not find more by uh, of those tools, but I think it's because they're buried in other subject headings. I don't think it's reflective. I think it's just some of it would be in remote sensing, some of it would be in other stuff, and they're just not clustered in a way that we think makes sense, which yeah. is again a kind of a bit of an argument for it. If someone was willing to do the work, which the answer maybe we're not, um, someone to do a kind of a, a more <laughs> to Daniel's point, actually quite subjective, but kind of I don't know, informed clustering of some of these papers into clusterings and categorizations that make more sense. Because also you can have community science papers that are from different fields. It doesn't, I mean, environmental monitoring is one, but there can be others as well. Yeah, and it, it goes back to the conversation we were having on the, the Monday call um, that a lot of this in history is going to be buried in uh, critical making and um, you know STEM education and maker technologies. Um, so how how deep we want to go in pulling that back into the open hardware literature is a I think a matter of you know the same thing we're talking about here like how much is too much. Um, as the timekeeper and call facilitator, we are within about five minutes of our hour together being up. Um, any final comments from folks on the call or Jenny, anything, final considerations that you have or Felipe, uh, final instructions to, to get us all energized for now doing the lit review? Uh, nothing major for me. I think we've we've kind of run out of steam on the um, extra pieces, which is, is good because we, we've covered them all. But I think it would be helpful for, as we um, disperse into smaller groups, because I think from what I understand, the idea is that smaller groups will tackle each of the sections. So I think there's just the, my major question from the start, I think is, is basically perhaps just trickled down <laughs> to that working group who start on the scientific instrumentation piece to decide how much work it effectively comes down to how much work that group are willing to do and think is useful to do in terms of the, the literature um, from the instrumentation side. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be part of that particular grouping. Um, so yeah, I, maybe the, those who are also thinking you'd be interested to participate in that section, I would propose that we have a, a more in-depth discussion in a smaller group, which always makes it easier to kind of go back and forward and then propose to the wider group how we think to tackle it. And the wider group can tell us if they think that's a good idea or not. Does that sound reasonable? Absolutely, that's extremely helpful. Um, I just wanted to, to say a quick thing about the previous call. So we we had uh, Michael Weinstein say, uh, talking about the, a disconnect or something that he perceives as a gap between the legal literature. Uh, and everything that happens in a context of an open hardware project that is not um, um, covered by the license. And we know that that's a whole lot. So that's an important uh, thing that we need to dig into as we go back to the uh, legal papers. And then we had a conversation with science um, on so society, um, social economic and public policy with Allison in the call. And then Allison demonstrated to us the rise of a domain of, um, of writing and great literature concerning public policy. And in that call, we identified a meso level, um, which is an institutional uh, policy. So we have public policy, we have institutional policies and a lot of the literature that we have and we covered already on social and economic aspects of open hardware uh, development operate at a mi more micro level, a project uh, level. So uh, we, we learned that from the call. 
in LVG, we have this big question, which is how to tackle the problem of the lack of specificity in the domain of scientific instrumentation with open hardware, which is a, a practical methodological question that we need to return to, and where we should put the papers and, and the, the scholarship on standards for open hardware. So um, next call is going to be a call with Danielle uh, Mitchin uh, to discuss methodological aspects. So it will be a great opportunity for us to dig into uh, in, with more specificity how we're going to go about uh, developing the five uh, uh, themes that we, we have. So I'm going to put here the link again for those of you who have not uh, had the opportunity to look into the documents yet um where we have instructions and that's pretty much it oh um i'm sorry this is not um I, i'm getting a 404 here um just a second sorry um i have this one here for open hardware um so you can yes so uh, many of you have already seen the document but we have the five components there we're going to divide in five groups and we can reconvene and, and discuss the details so thank you so much for being uh, with us all along for these three calls and i think we we made some considerable progress and we just need to continue and actually sit read papers and and you know and draft the article <laughs>